This episode of Selling with Social is brought to you by the 10th Annual AAISP Leadership Summit, where the sales community comes together to learn, share, and network. Join Vingresso and your sales peers April 3rd through the 5th, 2018 in Chicago, Illinois by visiting bit.ly forward slash AAISP Leadership 2018 and use the code LEADERSHIP1095 at registration. And now to selling with social. The other thing I find that salespeople do is they're constantly trying to sell what the person needs, what the prospect needs. People don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Jennifer Darling. Hello, Mario. I am so excited you're on the Selling with Social podcast. Thank you so much, my friend, for joining me. I've had enjoyed my time getting to know you over however long we've been connected on social. I think it's been about two years. Actually, we met, this is so funny, I don't know if you remember, we met in a hotel lobby at the coffee shop Wow. in San Francisco. No, I don't. This is brand new to me. Wait, wait, I forgot. <laughs> How did we do that? I know. Well, Where we were, were we? there for, it was a how to launch a book or something, some kind of how to launch your book thing, oh. seminar, whatever. And we, yes. yeah, you know, I talk to, I make friends with everybody. So you're in the line ahead of me. You're now going to be my new BFF. <laughs> I do remember we were in San Mateo or Foster City, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. We're in the Bay Area. Right. Well, fantastic. Well, I'm excited to have you on on the show with me today. We've been watch I've been watching you and of course you are into speak- I've been stalking you. You've been stalking me. No, that's a good that's not not stalking me, no. <laughs> but speaking, training, consulting, all around sales yeah. and helping individuals be able to achieve more and be better. So do me a favor. I've obviously given you a background. We've got sales, sales leaders, marketers sales and aim folks, business owners, just give us a little background about Jennifer Darling. Sure. I have spent the last 20 years in sales and sales management for media companies. So I basically was in charge for either selling or managing sales teams for companies like Comcast and then station affiliates like NBC, Fox, CBS, and selling advertising to all kinds of companies, local businesses, all the way up to some of the clients I handled were Chevy and McDonald's and Taco Bell. So just a big range of different kinds of various clients. And I was in charge of the sales selling marketing. So we kind of have a long history of both sales and marketing. And then a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to jump off that bus and I wanted to become a Jeffrey Gittimer certified advisor. So I went and got, I got certified by Jeffrey, spent four days with him and started conducting workshops for him, which was fine and dandy. But then as I was doing that, I was creating my own content almost at like lightning speed. So I'm creating my own stuff. I'm making it customized for the people that I'm running into and the people in my audience. And before you know it, I've got my own programs. I'm not really, you know, I'm still doing some stuff from Jeffrey and he's a big mentor of mine, but I've got my own products now, my own programs, and I help organizations who want to connect and engage with their customers so they can activate their sales. Good old Jeffrey Gittimer. I got to have him on my show. Hopefully we'll get him one day on selling with social. So do me a favor. Yeah, I think you have a good chance of getting him. All right. Well, we'll see if we can get him on the show here. Do me a favor, Jennifer. Tell us something about yourself that we wouldn't know or couldn't know by looking at your social profiles. All right. Well, there's quite a few. I keep, you know, you seem like you put it all out there on social media, but there are a few things I hold back. 
So when I was working at the NBC station here in Sacramento, I launched a campaign with a partner of mine called Project Healthy Kids, which was a childhood obesity campaign. It was a really big deal. It was both private and public partnerships. And we ran a huge media campaign about overcoming childhood obesity. Well, Maria Shriver's team got wind of this. And so they flew up to Sacramento and they scheduled a special interview. And I was one of the panelists in the room. And I sat right across from Maria Shriver as she interviewed us about the childhood obesity campaign that we created. So I actually got to sit and be interviewed by Maria Shriver, which was super cool. A few weeks later, we see her at the county fair. (laughs) Ah, What are the odds? Yeah, she's there with her kids as we're all watching the display. Get this. This is kind of weird. Of a cow having twin babies live in front of all of us. So me and Maria Shriver, we go back professionally and personally. (laughs) We're even involved (laughs) in a birth together. (laughs) No, now the world knows that, right? But Uh, nobody knew that before. (laughs) All right. Well, someone's going to have to listen in order to be able to find out that information and value. That's that's (laughs) very good. You know, I was excited to bring you on board because a lot of the stuff that we talked about was really more on the practical and tactical. And you had some great ideas on, you know, helping sales achieve more and be better and grow. But oftentimes, especially with new salespeople coming into the field, What we see is those sales folks may have a harder time picking up the phone or even feeling less inclined to just have a sales conversation. There's a special kind of fear. Now, it could be doesn't necessarily young, it could be old, it could be middle-aged, it could be whatever the case might be. But I want to move right into talking about some of the common fears that are holding people back in general on having conversations. Give me an idea of what do you think is going on from a marketplace perspective? Yeah, and I think it also has to do with the kind of sales job that you have. So it depends on the company and the size of company. If you are working for a media company, for example, you are doing everything from prospecting, lead generation, marketing, everything throughout the entire sales cycle. So you're in charge of making all of your own cold calls, new prospecting calls, and you know, sometimes you get so busy managing and fulfilling your business that you start to slow down on making calls and then you need to get caught back up. So you're absolutely right. It happens with new people, but I think it also can happen with professionals that have been doing sales calls for a while as well, because maybe they just haven't made a new business sales call, business development sales call in a while. Now, what I found to be the case is that there are some common fears amongst most people. And the obvious one is fear of rejection. You know, somebody is going to tell me no, and I just, I can't deal with that rejection. So I actually turn that upside down and celebrate rejection, right? Everybody knows that the more no you get that you're closer to a yes. Everyone knows that. And so how do we celebrate those? I do this funky thing. It's so elementary, but it's so much fun and everyone loves it. Where I have a blue sheet with blocks and I put little sparkly smiley faces there so we can celebrate that we're actually getting a lot closer to having closed business. So fear of rejection is number one. We all know that. But there are a couple other ones too, which I find interesting. And one is fear of interrupting people. So I don't want to interrupt somebody. They're in the middle of their day. I mean, we just got to deal with the fact that we're going to interrupt people. And it's okay because if you have a good reason for calling somebody, it's actually not an interruption. It's an addition to their business, not an interruption at all. And the other fear that I find is people don't want to sound sleazy or salesy, or aggressive. And you can be an awesome salesperson without being salesy or aggressive. You can be assertive. That's different than aggressive. And I'm not sure if you've read the book Challenger Sale, Mario, but it talks about the best kind of salesperson is the person who is challenging thoughts and ideas and their customers to make them think in new and different ways. And that's not actually a novel idea. Gittimer teaches the same thing too, is challenge people to think in different ways. And so that's okay. Like you just have to be all right with knowing those things are going to happen and they're normal and pick up the phone and make sales calls. A lot of people are hiding behind emails to make those sales calls. 
And you and I talked, Mario, about really the best approach. You have a name for it. I think you call it Omni Approach. And I call it a triad is that you got to make a phone call. You've got to make an email and you have to make a social media introduction. If you do all three of those things, you'll have a lot more success and you'll feel better about making phone calls. I was reading an article about cold calling and people have just fear of cold calling, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. But then we take our foot off the gas and then we come back to it a couple weeks later, it becomes hard again. Yeah. So you just have to keep that consistency going. And that's kind of with almost with anything though, right? The less you do it and the more that you go into autopilot, the harder it's going to be to get back into it. It's kind of like oh, yeah. weight loss. <laughs> oh my God. Tell me about it. I've been going to step aerobics. I like, I walk in the door and I'm hurting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was, I don't even know what I did. I think I ran the other day to school because I was, well, either I think it was my son, my seven year old, he's Marshawn, was late and we ran. And then the next morning I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, my back is hurting. My calves are hurting. My legs are hurting. I was like, that's really bad. <laughs> I knew really like, bad. How did this happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I like what you said about, you know, reaching out and having more sales conversations. And it's really that fear of rejection interrupting people, feeling salesy, and the fear of being too aggressive. I also think, though, that we have, especially in live environments where you're networking, where you're at an event, we have a inability to focus. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? So as an example, I had a client I went out to dinner with, and he gave me a story that a sales rep had been calling on him for about 60 days, reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, and he was emailing social phone. And it turns out they ended up at the same exact event together. What also turns out is that he ended up sitting right next to the salesperson, shoulder to shoulder. And the <laughs> VP of sales enablement recognized him. But throughout the whole entire conference, the individual was connected to his laptop doing email. And he never bothered to look up to actually see that the VP of sales enablement that he'd been trying wow. to get into his office for was sitting right next to him. And so and it turns out he ended up doing a call with him a couple of weeks later and says, hey, how'd you like the conference? Whatever it was. He's like, oh, it was a great conference. Were you there? And he goes, I was. In fact, we were sitting in this session together. He's like, you were? And he was like, I was sitting right next to you. Oh, you my never gosh. bothered to look up. So that's that issue of focus, right? We're so digitally connected kind of the same issue that we have when you go to a restaurant and you see a family of four and everybody's on their mm -hmm. phone and not talking to each other, <laughs> right? So I think that also too is the inability to focus because of the squirrel running across the, mm -hmm. the fence or you know the shiny new object. And that is preventing us from having those good sales conversations where we can network with somebody. Like I'm always in tune when I'm at a business event to listening in who's talking right. about what so that I can possibly have engaged in a conversation and potentially add value. But I do get what you're saying in terms of having these sales conversations and people are more comfortable. Do you find that in your training with different sales organizations that the younger you are, the more fear you have of actually talking to somebody and you'd rather be behind email or text or social or does it not matter? You know, age actually, or experience, I shouldn't say age. I want to use the word experience because okay. I think that's probably more the issue but I could see age thinking that because a younger person might be more so, you might think they're into social media. But what I've actually found is I have talked to tons of millennials who reach out to me and ask me for help with their social media because they're not using social media. They're not doing the things that we they're doing. So I'm a Gen Xer. So, you know, I'm right in the middle of those two big groups of people. And I think that a lot of people think the millennials are so engaged in their phone and not in community. And the ones I'm talking to are actually not that way. They recognize that this is an issue and they are really putting their, you know, heels in the sand to say, and saying that, you know, we're creating community. We actually really appreciate having conversations with people. So I don't see it as much as an age thing. What I do see is that if people aren't doing the sales calls consistently, like we talked about before, that's where it becomes a problem. And 
I've seen it happen time and time again where you go out and you make tons of sales calls because you have to make quota and your quota is depending on what kind of company, you know, it could just be the revenue, it could be the numbers of calls or activity. So you go out and you do tons of calls and then you create a ton of business and then you stop doing calls because you're so busy with the business. I actually did, I took a look at our sales cycle whenever I was managing a group in the television industry. And what I noticed was that we were always chasing ourselves in first quarter to make budget because everybody was taking their feet off the gas and not making a lot of calls during Thanksgiving and Christmas. So you could see the cycle every year for uh, several years being not a lot of activity in November, or December, not a ton in January because now I need to sit down and create my plan for the year. And then by the time you get going in February and March, then you're ramping up. And I've found that most sales cycles are about three months, no matter what the industry is. This could be about the average three months. And so then you're into April and now you're into an oh no month and I need to make more calls, but yet it hasn't. So like it's a whole cycle that keeps happening. That's just not good. And then you chase your tail for the rest of the year and you get to November, December again, you're like, I need to take a breath. So what I have found is if you don't do that and you just make a consistent amount of activity every month, including November and December, you actually will create more sales opportunities. You will end up with more calls because you'll have, you know, I realize we're on a podcast, so you can't see my hands in a curve here, but it's like a roller coaster ride the other way, where this way your consistency ends up increasing your conversions so that instead of having this up and down cycle, then you're having consistent activity because you're getting better at making the sales calls. You don't care anymore about the fears. And there's, you know, a hundred other fears other than what we just said. Those become a non-issue. And you're consistently talking to people and learning and finding out what people's needs are. And you're able to deliver better and more quality. So like what you said about obviously consistency, and I think most people who are listening and say, yeah, 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 that makes sense. You know, like we know that we have to be consistent, right? And, and you may have seen the video that I published called the rule of 10, right? So it's 10 emails, 10 calls, 10 text messages, 10 LinkedIn messages, 10 video messages, and 10 social engagements. And if you do that 10, 10, 10, 10 times the six elements mm -hmm. that I just mentioned, that's an outreach of 60 people. Now you do that 10 times in a month. Not 20, not every day, or maybe you break it down right. five per day, right? But do it 10 times in a month and you've potentially made outreach to 600 different people. So it's really the rule of 10, but it's also including that omni-channel approach, right? Which is multifaceted, multi-approach to engaging. So let's just pretend now that people understand, got it. I got to be yeah, more consistent. Yeah, got it. I, I know go, I need to do this, the activity. This is a, a great reminder that I've got to drive towards consistent activity in order to be able to get to the next level. And even if you're in a, a named account manager, it's all about consistent activity with creating outreach to the different types of buyers going high and wide and deep inside of an organization. So give me some tips for helping people get ready for sales calls. What yeah. would you give as your to the students that you train some best practices? Yeah. I'm going to give you a few different tips, at least three, maybe four tips. I, don't see a ton of t salespeople warming up for sales calls. When what I think about, when I, well, physically and mentally. So when I think about professional sports players, what I know is that they're all warming up before they go play basketball, football, golf. They're all warming up. Yeah. But as salespeople, we think we're just going to go pick up the phone and do it. Just make the call. And that's the warm up. Well, you can actually do some things physically that will help you both physically and mentally for making those phone calls. All right. I haven't, I've never done anything physically for okay. a sales call. So, so gonna, warm me up here. Let me get I'm gonna give it going. To you, my friend. Yeah. You're going to be doing this. Okay. So there, one thing that you can do is you can actually stand in a power pose and to imagine what that is. It looks like a Superman or Superwoman pose. My friend, Dr. Selena Bartlett is a neuroscientist and she studied the brain under multiple situations of stress and MRI. Our eyes. And what she found was we eat crappy food to help increase the dopamine in our brain and send good vibes up to make us happy. Well, the same thing happens if you stand in a power pose for five minutes. So if you stand in that power pose for five minutes, you're actually increasing the good endorphins in your body that are sending signals up into your brain, making you happy. 
And you know, everybody knows that when you get on the phone, you can hear the person on the other side. So, you know, pick up the phone and you smile before you dial, you get all that. Well, this goes to another level because it actually gets your body and your brain in a mood that is much happier than when you started. So if you're somebody who's hesitant to make sales calls now, you do that for five minutes, you're already feeling better before you pick up the phone. I'm going to add additional element to that, which is to get your favorite song out. I mean, how many times have you been to a big call? You've put your favorite song on the radio and you rock that song and you sing it and you're super excited and you get yourself and you're really stoked up for that big call you're going on. I suggest you do the same thing for sales calls too. And there's more than just the reason of the endorphins. The other reason is as you are putting on your favorite song, you want to sing it and get your vocal cords warmed up. Because sometimes we can get on the phone and we actually, as human beings, it's very normal to only use the top portion of your lungs. So you're not using your full lung capacity. And when you get on the phone, you start to sound like a stalker. You know, you're kind of breathing short breaths, which the other person can tell. So if you do the power pose and you do the singing to your favorite song, you're increasing the endorphins, but you're also expanding your lung capacity. And when you expand your lung capacity, your voice gets deeper and more confident and you sound much better on the phone. And I guarantee you that the person on the other end, whether they can hear it or not, they can feel it in the energy that you have. So those are two tips for warming up your body in your brain. What do you think? Do you think you could possibly try to slide those in five minutes before you make your sales calls, Mario? So I have a habit and that is, is that when I'm not on, meaning video, virtual meeting, and I'm just sitting here and I'm doing work and I'm plowing through contracts or legal or, you know, agreements, et cetera. Maybe you um, need to do the power pose for that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I have a thing where I turn on the music and I have the music and have my stations and I actually like humming or singing along while I'm actually working. Do I have the ability to multitask? No, because what it, what it does allow me to do is allows me to tune out all the other stuff and it creates that white noise, if you would, for me. So I can create some very focused attention on what I'm trying to do. So I do believe on the, on the favorite song part, definitely you get jammed up and you get all hyped up on something for being ready to make something happen. The power pose, on the other hand, I'm going to say, if I stood in the power pose, with my arms up, you know, above my head <laughs> for five minutes, I think my arms would fall asleep. No, no, they're not. They're on your hips. They're not above your head. Oh, okay. So that's the power pose that I know of, which is your your yeah. arms are, you know, like your hands are above your head, you know. But so no. you're talking about standing here with your arms on your there hips. You okay, well that makes it easier because I could rest my my hands against my hips. Yeah, you <laughs> and you have your feet like shoulder length apart and you have your hands on your hips. That's the power pose we're talking about. We don't want you to pass out before you make sales calls. <laughs> exactly. You excited before you're making sales calls. You know, There's... if you were, you were having a trouble jogging the other day, I certainly don't want to give you that assignment. That is hilarious. All right. Well, listen, before you get to tip number three on getting ready for sales calls, what I'd like to do is take a short break and listen to this message from our program sponsor. Awesome. I'm super excited to share that Vangressa will be joining the AAISP and hundreds of sales leaders in Chicago for the 10th annual AAISP Leadership Summit this April 3rd through the 5th, 2018. In fact, I personally will be presenting and I want to invite you to join me. The Leadership Summit brings together sales leaders from around the globe for a learning experience unlike any other. Attendees will find workshops, group learning, a technology expo packed full of today's leading solution and service providers, and the infamous annual Inside Sales Awards Gala. To receive your deeply discounted rate, visit bit.ly forward slash AAISP Leadership 2018. That's bit.ly forward slash AAISP Leadership 2018 and use the code LEADERSHIP1095 at registration for an amazing Vengresso only discount. And now back to Selling with Social. Okay, so before we left, you gave us two tips out of three that you're gonna give us for getting ready for sales calls. Power pose, favorite song, pump up your blood, endorphins, the full capacity of your lungs as opposed to just the top half. What's number three? So number three is to take a notepad, draw a line down the middle and a line across the middle. So it's like a T or it's like a plus. 
And I want you to write on one side wants and the other side needs. Wait, wait, wait. On, write on what? On one side, I want you to write wants, W-A-N-T-S, mm -hmm. and the other side needs. And on the bottom, questions. Now, not everybody needs to do this, but if you're like me, you get ideas from talking to people. And when you get ideas, you tend to interrupt everybody and stop them and you don't let them say what they're saying. You're saying your ideas before you've ever listened completely to the, what the other person has to say. Therefore, maybe your ideas actually aren't the right ideas because you didn't listen completely. The other thing I find that salespeople do is they're constantly trying to sell what the person needs what the prospect needs. People don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. So you have to sell them what they want and then give them what they need. And for professional salespeople who've been doing this a long time, I'm sure they know that. But for newer people, they don't realize that they're given a product or an idea or something and they're just trying to sell, sell, sell what the person needs. But you have to sell them what they want, what their emotions are telling them and their logic will follow behind that. And then you deliver both of the things. So I always put wants and needs so that way I can decipher when I'm trying to have the conversation back to them, which things I know they need, but I don't really necessarily need to tell them that on the phone. Maybe I do if we're going to sit down and have a proposal, depending on the size of business. And then the questions at the bottom, so I don't interrupt them whenever they're trying to get their full thought out and I can ask the questions in a more systemized process. Wouldn't you agree though that needs are aka also known as requirements? It just depends. And you know, much of this does depend because it's the type of business that you're in. You know, when you're selling media products, it's a very complex sale and a very complex solution. If you're selling something that's a simple sale and a simple solution, then you might not have to go to that length. But if you're in a complex environment with a complex solution, you definitely, you know, you need to look at both sides of that coin. At the same time, you know, you definitely are peeling back the onion, right? So the questions become super important. Every question you ask is really important because you have to peel back the need behind the need behind the need. Like what do they really need is a different thing. So that's just finding out what their needs are so you can give them the solutions. But what I'm referring to more so is not just selling them a bunch of I know you need this. I know you need this. I know you need this. You need to listen to their wants because maybe they need something, but what they really want is to make sure that they look good. So your purchase needs to make sure they look good. It needs to deliver too, but they need to look good to their boss. So how are you going to support both of those things? I see. I'm glad you clarified that because I was thinking here in my mind that the wants, and I was going, going straight into products and features, right? And, and oftentimes what you want is not necessarily what you can get. And even if you do want that and somebody can provide the want, it's really what is the business need today and going into the future, right? That we focus in on. So my perspective was, you know, we've always teach salespeople to understand what are the business needs and then sell to the needs, right? But what you're saying is, is the wants could also include more of an emotional component of the sale, right? I need to, well, I need, <laughs> I want to yeah. make sure, I need to make sure that this project goes off well, because if it doesn't, it's my job, right? right. Uh, I want to be able to save, you know, the organization 10% off the budget. And that's the reason why I need to do a conversion. So I think there's like the, that emotional aspect. And I think if we can, I would agree with you that if you can compartmentalize that to understanding the wants and the needs from an emotional standpoint, then I think that you definitely can start selling to some, both the wants and the needs, quite frankly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was pitching a client the other day to do a speaking engagement in Florida and they thought they needed somebody in Florida because they needed to make a specific budget amount. And what I found was they didn't actually need a person in Florida. They could take a person in California as long as they stuck within their budget. I added, so I said, since I'm already going to be there, why don't I, we talked about they could only have one session. They only had the budget for one session. I said, since I'm already going to be there, why don't I just do two sessions? So what I found out was what he wanted and needed. What he needed was these certain things. And what he wanted really was the two sessions to come within his budget, to deliver a person who is the right person for the audience. And I was able to deliver all of those things for him. And so, you know, I'll find out, I don't have the answer yet. I'll find out the answer tomorrow, whether they choose me or not. But just knowing those additional factors, somebody else could have just stopped at, okay, the budget, you need somebody from Florida and maybe they're not even a perfect fit because you have to be within those needs.
So yeah. thanks for clarifying that too. Yeah, that makes sense. I get you on your um, idea there. You talked all about, you know, understanding wants and needs, and these are things that we absolutely have to uncover, but oftentimes in those wants and needs come the issue of objections, Mm -hmm. right? And as you uncover certain items, you are going to uncover that some of those needs or wants may actually turn into a real objection of something that you can't do, or maybe it's an objection into, you know, the past experience that they may have had with your organization or a past sales mm -hmm. rep or whatever the case might be. So give me an, I know you had some great discussion points around the secret to handling objections. Talk to me a yeah. little bit about that. Yeah. And what I find that's the best way to handle objections is to be proactive about it. What that means is that I actually bring up the objections before they come up. There are always three objections that are common to your business. And two of them, we all get, no matter what business in you're in, is time and money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. So those are just, those are for sure, we're going to get those. Then there's a third common objection, depending on the industry you're in. And what I find is that we don't, unless you've been doing sales a long time, you don't really sit down to think about why is this an objection and how am I going to handle it every time? And every time you get new objections, it's almost like when the objection comes up, you pause to think about, oh my God, there's an objection. What am I going to say? What's the right thing to say? And in that pause is doubt in the consumer's mind. It's not like you want to jump on it and attack it, but you don't want to have too much pause about it or else it may have some doubt. So I find that if you proactively deal with the objections and the way that that could work is if it's time, you can talk about how and given a story or an example of how time was a past objection for a previous client and how you overcame that. And they found that time actually really wasn't an objection, that the value came somewhere else and so the time was fine. So I like to deal with those proactively. And then whenever I get new objections, what I tell people is keep a log of objections, write them down. Every time you hear new objections, write it down on a piece of paper and figure out what a rational response to that objection is so that when you get it next time, you know how to overcome that objection. My very first sales job, well, actually probably my very first sales job was being a waitress at my college restaurant, but Whenever I was a formal sales job, I was a TV salesperson in Northern Michigan. Okay. It was like freezing cold. You know, you heard your grandparents' stories, snow both ways that you drove uphill. You know, it was like that. I drove an hour each way in the snow and my little grand dam with sports tires that didn't make it through snow. <laughs> and I, I made this call on Barry Sears, who's the owner of Manistee Ford in Manistee, Michigan. I walked into his office. I knocked on the door. The receptionist was there and she looked at me like I had two heads. I said, you know, my first two months on the job, I'm here to meet the decision maker. Who's the person in charge of advertising? And she's like, oh gosh, another one, right? So she says, well, hold on, let me go get him. And the hallway got really long. Like you've seen this on movies, like the Matrix. All of a sudden that hallway is like a hundred yards long. And this big <laughs> man is coming at me from down the football field. And, you know, he's just looking like the monster I imagined him to be. He gets down to me and I said, hi, are you the person in charge of advertising? And he just starts yelling at me, no kidding, screaming at me. Like, what are you doing here? All you guys come in here all the time trying to sell me stuff. I don't want to buy any advertising, blah, 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 blah. And so I left that call. I mean, I went to my car, drove home, got in bed, pulled on my electric blanket. And I have no idea how I got up to make cold calls again the next day, but I did do that. A couple months later, I ran into Barry at one of these business after hours chamber of commerce meetings and I went to the bar and I bought two beers. I walked back to Barry and I said, I'm so sorry I was in your dealership the other day and I was wasting your time, what you said. So I thought maybe I could buy you a beer and make up for it. We became best friends. He bought the first advertising he had ever bought. But what I found through that process was that he was just really annoyed by sales reps. They had never approached him the right way. He didn't like the cold call. He didn't like that there was any value to talk about. But what he really hated was his competition. He didn't like their commercials. He didn't mm -hmm. like that they came out in their commercials with clowns and balloons and hot dogs right. and 
popcorn. The sales reps were actually a secondary dislike because they all wanted to get him to make commercials that look like that. So once I discovered that, I was able to actually help him create a different idea for commercials and then he bought advertising. That's a great story. I love <laughs> I love the hundred foot long hallway. Here <laughs> comes the man. I was just envisioning a giant, you know, giant burly man <laughs> with a bald head. <laughs> <laughs> In the car dealership. That's a great story. Can I go back to something you said, which was, it was a while back and you talked about if you pause too long, it can create doubt. Tease that out for me. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that if you're on the phone with somebody and they give you whatever objection it is, I don't want to use time and money right now because I just use those, but I've got to talk to my business partner. That's another common objection, right? I've got to talk to somebody else. I mean, it's okay to pause, but if you pause and you wait too long and then you, then you start flubbing whatever you're going to say because you weren't prepared for that objection. So you don't know what to say. So you start to stutter, you pause and you start to stutter and you're not, you don't make a really intelligent response. Yeah. When I was a sales manager, I had a salesperson accidentally email me a message about me that wasn't very nice, that wasn't intended for me. <laughs> and I got the me- yeah, right? I got the I, message. Almost every and- one of us has had a, a message that wasn't supposed to go to the person. <laughs> Yeah, it was not supposed to come to me. The words were not even appropriate for business. And I was looking at the screen and the screen became like purple and pink. You remember when you were little and you looked too close at the TV screen and it was purple and pink. and, And I'm like, I can't even believe I'm seeing this right now. So I emailed the person. I said, was this meant for me? And I'm only 5'4". This, my salesperson was in his 60s. And about a six foot two man comes walking into my office and he was so sorry, you know, but I didn't know how to deal with that situation the first time it happened. Now I'm proud to say it never happened again, but but had it happened again, I would have known how to intelligently respond. Instead, I had to respond with my emotions and I didn't really know what to do. Like I probably should have fired the guy, right? But I didn't because I didn't know what to do. So I think that just making sure that you take a mental note, and I really think writing stuff down is really important. Keeping a log of your objections so you know how to appropriately respond. Your brain will take you back to that objection. But if you don't write down and remember a really rational response for that, because you might not hear that objection again, then you're, you might feel the same way and you know flutter around with the words again when you get the objection again. I think it just sounds a lot more professional, like you know what you're doing, and it ups your confidence level too. So it makes yeah, you sound but- confident. But, and you're giving an illustration, which I do agree with, which is if you've heard something before, you know, make sure you have, have it documented, understand how you're going to handle that objection. But in the scenario where you haven't heard a specific objection, I believe it's absolutely okay to be able to pause and think about what should I say before a thousand percent or, or even say, you know, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm so glad. Yeah. 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 Because what it'll allow you to do is it'll allow you to be able to follow up now with that individual, right? I am so, so happy that you said that because you're absolutely right. So I do tell people that too with the objections is if you do get the objection you haven't heard before, yeah, absolutely. You don't know the answer and that's completely appropriate and authentic. I don't know actually, I'm not sure how to think about that right now or what I think about that or how I know about that. A thousand percent definitely agree with you. Thanks for the clarification on that. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation and I think we've given some valuable tips on the different types of fears that hold people back from having more sales conversations. We definitely have talked about how to prep and get ready for sales calls. We got our power pose that we should be doing. We've got listening to some music and rocking out and getting ourselves ready to go. That's that's some good practical stuff. And then handling objections and how to make sure that we're documenting things that we hear and having an objection handling response ready to go. Mm, I like the way you say that. But if we don't, if we've never heard the objection, at the end of the day, it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to do the follow-up. So I've thoroughly enjoyed. Jennifer, do me a favor. If someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Is it through LinkedIn, Twitter, your website, email? You tell me. 
Yeah, LinkedIn is a great way to get a hold of me. Although I learned yesterday there are 257 Jennifer Darlings. I thought there was only one. So I'm Jennifer Darling. If you search for Jennifer Darling professional speaker, you will find me there. You can also find me on my website, which is my last name, darlingcoaching.com. Darlingcoaching.com. You can find me there. And we will put those links into the show notes as well. And uh, as my parting question, here's my question to you on a personal note your all time favorite movie. What is it? Okay. So I was listening to your podcast the other day and I was thinking about this. The movie I watch twice a year, every single year is Chevy Chase's Christmas Vacation. (laughs) I know all the lines. The movie kills me. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is hysterical. The whole movie is just ridiculous and funny. And I don't have to do a lot of thinking when I watch it. I can just enjoy the silliness of it. All right. We've got, uh, (laughs) that's the first time we've had that one on our show. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I've enjoyed having you on the show here. And for all of you who are listening into Selling with Social, stay tuned for this next message here. Don't forget to join Vingresso and hundreds of sales leaders from around the globe, April 3rd through the 5th, 2018 in Chicago for the 10th annual AAISP Leadership Summit. To receive your deeply discounted rate, visit bit.ly forward slash AAISP 2018. That's bit.ly forward slash AAISP 2018. And use the code LEADERSHIP1095 at registration for an amazing Vengresso only discount. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcasts to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes, along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. 